He was probably around forty-five years old. He was calm and self-assured, piercing brown eyes that grabbed and wouldn't let go. He wore a shapeless gray suit with an open-necked white shirt that was wrinkled and dingy. Brown, Italian leather shoes. Andrew Clark was another kind of killer, but a killer all the same. Detective, he said. I know I'm grossly overweight and look out of shape, but I could take you out right here on the patio. I could and would, if it was asked of me by our country. He was a truly scary man. I could hear Gene Sterling's kids inside the house, the refrigerator door opening and closing, birds whooping and twittering in background trees. It was an eerie scene. There's one basic proposition in covert action, in subversion, sabotage. Clock went on. Being better at it than the other guy, we can do anything we want. No rules, I said. That's what you're telling me. You live, you work in a closed world that virtually isn't governed. You could say that your world is completely antisocial. He snorted a laugh. <laughs> Not one fucking rule. Once we're commissioned for a job, there are no rules. Think about it. I would definitely think about it. I considered the idea of Clark trying to kill me if our country asked him to. No rules, a world peopled by ghosts. Jack and Jill came to the hill. Could Jack be a trained assassin? Gene Sterling seemed to think so. What about Jill? And then, why were they killing celebrities in Washington? Why had they threatened President Burns? Had they been commissioned to do the job? If so, by whom? To what end? What was their cause? Nobody was safe anymore. There are no rules. There are ghosts and human monsters, and they are very real in our lives, especially in my life. On the morning after the Kennedy Center killing, Detective John Sampson worked the upscale side of Garfield Park, the West End. He was keeping his eyes out for Alex's homeless suspect, who'd been spotted the afternoon of Chanel Green's murder. He had decided to visit the Theodore Roosevelt School on his street canvas. The exclusive military academy used Garfield Park for some of its paramilitary maneuvers and also athletics there was a slim possibility that a sharp-eyed cadet had seen something. A homeless old motherfucker, Samson thought, as he climbed the military school's front graystone steps. A sloppy and disorganized thrill killer who left fingerprints and other clues at both crime scenes, and still nobody could nail his candy ass to the wall. Why was that? What were they getting all wrong here? What were they messing up on? Sir, can I help you? A scrawny, toe-headed cadet came up to him. Washington Police. I need to speak with whoever's in charge. You arrange that, soldier? Yes, sir, he said. The cadet saluted him, and Samson had to fight back the day's first, and maybe only, smile. More than three hundred scrubbed and steam-pressed cadets were crammed into Lee Hall at nine o'clock in the morning. From his stiff wooden seat in the school auditorium, the Sojourner Truth School killer saw the towering black man entering Lee Hall with Colonel Wilson. He recognized him instantly. Detective John Sampson, Alex Cross's friend and partner. The killer immediately began to panic, to experience the outer edges of fear. He wondered if the Metro Police were coming for him right now. He wanted to run, but there was no way out of here now. He thought he was going to be sick. He felt like such a chump to get caught like this. Were the police about to arrest him in front of the entire school? The killer was holding his breath as Samson went over to the podium mic. The reason I'm here at your school this morning is that we're canvassing Garfield Park and everything that it touches. Two little kids were savagely killed there, both within the past week. The skulls of the children were crushed. The killer is a fiend in no uncertain terms. So that was why the imposing homicide detective was here. A goddamn fishing expedition. I'm going to leave my number at the precinct with the office here at school. 
You can contact me at any time, day or night, if you've seen anything that could be helpful to us. Does anybody have any questions? The killer wanted a shout from his seat. I'm the child killer, you feeble asshole. You're so much bigger, but I'm so much smarter than you could ever be. I'm only 13 years old. I'm already this good. Just wait until I get a little older. Chew on that, you dumb bastard. I couldn't sleep. Around ten o'clock, I decided to go for a drive to clear my head, maybe get a sharper insight into one of the murder cases. I don't know exactly where I was going, and yet I subconsciously did know. Both murder cases were running hard and fast inside my head. They were on dangerous parallel tracks. I kept reviewing my talk with the CIA contract killer, Andrew Clark. Could one of the ghosts be Jack? I found myself on the far side of the Beltway, in Mitchellville, I knew Christine Johnson lived out this way. And then, I was driving through her neighborhood. What in the hell was I doing? What was I thinking of? Had I been spending so much time around mad men that finally some of it rubbed off? I spotted Summer Street and made a quick right turn. I had to admit it was beautiful out in suburbia, even at night. Then I saw Christine Johnson's blue Mercedes in the driveway of a large, brick-faced colonial home. My heart jumped a little. Her car the only one in the driveway. I had the conscious thought that maybe this was not such a good idea. Dr. Cross didn't exactly approve of Dr. Cross's actions. This was real close to being inappropriate behavior. Just go home, I said out loud. Just say no. I stopped in front of the Johnson house. I could see lights burning brightly inside. Somebody seemed to be up. Christine Johnson has a nice car and a beautiful home, I told myself. She doesn't need any terrible trouble from you. Don't bring your monsters out here. She has a rich, lawyer husband. She's doing real fine for herself. I shut off the engine and got out of my car. I rang the bell, heard melodious chimes, and waited like a porch sculpture. Then Christine Johnson appeared at the front door. She had on faded jeans, a wrinkled yellow crew-neck sweater, and no shoes. Detective Cross... She was surprised, understandably so. Uh, nothing has happened on the case, I quickly reassured her. I just have a few more questions. That was true. She smiled then. You do work too late, too hard, even under the current circumstances. I couldn't turn this horrible thing off tonight. If this is a bad time, I'll stop by at the school tomorrow. That's, that's no problem. No, no, come on in, she said. I know how busy you are. She led me into the huge kitchen and offered me a drink. A beer sounds pretty good, I told her. Christine brought me a Heineken, an iced tea for herself. She sat across from me at an island counter that subdivided the kitchen. So what's up, Doc? she asked. What brings you to the Beltway? Honestly? I couldn't sleep. Then I had the bright idea that maybe we could cover some ground on the case, or maybe I just needed to talk to somebody. I finally confessed, and it felt pretty good. Well, that's okay. I can relate to that. I, I couldn't sleep myself, she said. I've been wound tight ever since Chanel's murder. I don't know why I wanted to tell her, but I did. I play the piano at night sometimes. There's a sun porch in our house, so the awful racket doesn't bother Damon or my grandmother too much. A little Gershwin, Brahms, a Jelly Roll Morton at one in the morning never hurt anyone. Christine Johnson smiled and seemed at ease with this kind of talk. Damon has mentioned your nocturnal piano playing a few times at school. You know, he occasionally brags about you to the teachers. He's a very nice boy, in addition to being a brainiac. We like him tremendously. Thank you, I said. I like him a lot myself. She suddenly changed gears. How long has it been since your wife died, Alex? It's going to be five years soon, I told her. This March, actually. The two of us were getting comfortable talking like this at the kitchen counter. Small talk at first, then bigger talk. Sojourner Truth School killer talk. It went on like this until almost midnight. I finally told her I needed to be heading home. At the front door, she surprised me with a peck on the cheek. Come back, Alex, she said if you need to talk again. We left it like that, 
a strange tableau at a strange time in our lives. I had no idea whether her lawyer husband was home or not. Was he up in the bedroom sleeping? Were they still together? It was another mystery to solve some day, but not this day. Tyson's Galleria in Tyson's Corner was, along with the neighboring Tyson Corner Mall, one of the largest shopping complexes in the United States. Sam Harrison had parked in the enormous Galleria lot at a little past 6 a.m. He had known from the start that he would have to carry out this murder alone. This one was over the top, even for Jack and Jill, even for the game of games. As he crossed onto Livingston Road, he attempted to clear his mind of everything except the terrible murder that lay ahead of him. This one was going to be tough, the hardest so far. The man he was about to kill had been one of his best friends. In the game of life and death, that didn't matter. He had no best friends. He had no friends at all. As far as he could tell, no one was up in the house at number 31 Livingston Road. He went straight to the new tone security box and punched in the code. So much for high security in the suburbs. There was no effective protection, really. Not from people like him. He entered the main part of the house. His heart pounded like a battering ram inside his chest. He could picture Aiden as if he were standing there beside him. Everything was peaceful and quiet and orderly inside the house. Kids' artwork and a school lunch menu attached to the refrigerator door with magnets. That made his heart sink. Aiden's kids. Aiden Jr. was nine years old. Charisse was six. As Jack began to climb the plush carpeted stairs, he had doubts for the first time. There can't be any doubts. Doubt and uncertainty weren't allowed. Not in Jack and Jill. Don't think, he commanded himself. He yanked up his pistol and hurried down the upstairs hallway to the master bedroom. Be Jack. Kill. He was three or four steps from the master bedroom when its door suddenly opened. A tall, balding man stepped out into the hall, only half awake, in the middle of a jaw-cracking yawn. It was General Aiden Cornwall. You! You son of a bitch! I knew it might be you! Yes, Aiden Cornwall knew everything in an instant. He understood Jack and Jill, where it was going, and why it was going there why there could be no turning back. Jack fired the silenced Beretta twice, and the target collapsed. Jack quickly stepped forward and caught the lifeless body before it could thud loudly against the floor. He looked down into the startled gray-blue eyes of the former member of the Joint Chiefs, part of the White House's Jack and Jill Emergency Task Force. One of the hounds had been taken out. Jack and Jill had struck back boldly at the Manhunters. Jack left a calling card on Aiden Cornwall's chest. Jack and Jill came to the hill to storm your picket fences. Once safe and sound, they easily found the flaw in your defenses. A noise in the hall. He looked up. Aiden's boy. Oh, Jesus God, no, he whispered out loud. The nine-year-old had recognized him. Jack fired the Beretta again. This was war. I was called to an emergency crisis team meeting at the White House at 8 a.m. on December 10th. Jay Greer grabbed me the moment I arrived inside the West Wing. Aiden Cornwall was murdered early this morning. It happened at his house out in McLean. It was Jack and Jill. They called us again. Called it in to us like we're mission control. He shook his head in sadness and disbelief. They killed Aiden's nine-year-old son, Alex. I found myself rocking back on my heels. Damn them! They kept changing the rules. Wait a minute, Alex. It gets worse. This morning, at five o'clock, the president's phone rang. It was Jill on the private line. She got through to him, and that just isn't possible. This couldn't be happening. The idea, the, the concept of the president as a murder target 